Funding for Remarkable People, Gene Walkinshaw, is made possible by the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and the Protocol Foundation. Our house is fortunate enough to be located near 270 steps that go from the freeway up to the top of Capitol Hill. And every morning I go do those steps. Number one, it's therapeutic. And number two, it's very good for your health to keep yourself going. In my case, I, I can't believe how lucky I am to have this fascination and love of video. I feel it's a gift from heaven of being able to do my thing. I just am amazed at what a span of history even my little life covers. I grew up with uh, three sisters and one brother. I had two sisters that were uh, 10 and 12 years older than I, and then one sister that was just two years older than I. So there were these four women, and I was the last one, the baby of the family, and probably spoiled. My father he was a road builder, and actually he built the last leg of the North Cascades Highway before they pushed it through over the pass. It ended Marble Mount, and my father had a camp there, and we'd go up in the summer and stay in his logging camp or his construction camps. So I was brought up hiking at a very, very tiny age and living in construction camps. He'd always have wonderful cooks that he would hire. And so he'd have these fabulous meals in the cookhouse, like pie and steak for breakfast, which as a little girl, of course, I loved. I grew up with a lot of outdoor activities. We'd ski up at Paradise, where we'd barrel vault down uh, Devil's Dip, and we'd have to hike up from Narada. I loved to play tennis. I loved to walk to school. I used to walk to school two miles and think nothing of it. My mother was always very democratic, very strong believer that everybody was equal. I was always brought up with a sense of democracy and feeling that I was not better than somebody else. We were quite well-to-do. I almost denied my background because I thought it, it does separate you. It does separate you. And I was brought up in a very, really a, a terribly uh, privileged, narrow little segment of Tacoma, <laughs> Tacoma, Washington. That's nothing like the East Coast. I think because of my background, I bent over backwards not to follow that path. So much of my life, I'd been seeking kind of the wrong goals, in a way. I thought it was very important to be secretary of this or president of that and so forth. And, and I guess I wasn't using people, but I was very aware of, of uh, I don't think I stepped on people, but I wasn't very happy with myself. When I came back to Seattle, I went to the Quaker Church. And while I was there, I met a man by the name of Floyd Schmo, And he'd started a project, uh, Houses for Hiroshima. 
he felt horrible about the bomb. And he thought that the least he could do would be to go and build some token houses of goodwill. And he asked me if I'd like to go to Hiroshima. Floyd Schmo had set up this project in Hiroshima the year after the war was ended and after the bomb. So by the time we got there, five years later, um, the city was still pretty destroyed, of course. I had that experience of working on Houses for Hiroshima. The main idea was to make friends, and it was just astounding that the Japanese were as kind as they were to us. While we were there, we built, I think, three houses. And I loved the Japanese people, particularly the women. So it was pure luxury for me to be able to do something like that. I really did feel, it was, it was an incredible experience for me. And I think that helped me grow up more than probably anything else. I'd just come back from Hiroshima and I was at the church and this guy, Walter Walkinshaw, had just come to Seattle. As he tells the story, looked across as he was meditating and he saw this ankle and then he looked up and he followed me home. And then we did meet socially. We fell in love. I was 26 when I was married. I just think we've been blessed with a lot of things that we had in common, not having a lot of gaps that we had to overcome. I think it's our love of the out of doors together. I think it's the Northwest. We started out living very cheaply in this city. When we were first married, I was living in an old warehouse down on Portage Bay, which was right near the Showboat Theater. And uh, we were right on the water. It was, a, it was a lovely location. I was paying $12.50 a month for rent. And some people have accused Walt for marrying me for, for that, because it was cheap living. <laughs> and after I had my baby, Charlie, uh, we went into his crib one day and we found that a rat had been sleeping with him. And it was at that point that we decided, whoops, we better get out of this place because we couldn't control the rodents. The 60s were, were wild and kind of wonderful times because the lid was off, but it was horrifying too. We did some pretty astounding shows at King in those days, which 
I'm not sure I would be able to do today with the leadership of the stations. The reason I was there was because the president then of King, Stim Bullitt, came to my door one day and knocked on it and asked me if I'd be interested in coming down and doing some interviewing for them. When I did get there to King, you can imagine how much I was liked. You know, the bosses <laughs> hear this, this totally unschooled un, uh, in broadcasting. You've seen her probably in the, if you've been to the Cirque Theater, you've seen her acting in plays there. Her husband is the director of the Cirque Theater. And I'm very glad to be able to have her come in today to be my guest. Well, it was very nice of you to invite me, and I'm very happy to be here. Ms. Keene, I was uh, trying to reach you. I was horrible. I did have to take a lot of knocks, and I did have to prove myself. I could never be a very good news person because I like to be too much of an advocate. <laughs> and um, at King, the advocacy was equality for everybody. If students want the freedom to demonstrate, do they still have to respect the ground rules? And under these conditions, what are the ground rules? Hello, I'm Roberta Bird, and today we're face to face with Seattle police and one university student. I produced with Roberta Bird Barr a show that was the first, and I am proud of this, that the Columbia School of Journalism in the year 1968 said that the show that Roberta Bird hosted and I produced was the only show in the nation to consistently cover minorities. So I just lucked into something and there was a marvelous combination of a person at the top at King who I knew felt as we did about the inequality of what was happening in our society. So Roberta and I were uh, sort of sheltered uh, by this management at King, which allowed us to cover topics that were kind of amazing to be covering. I mean, we covered abortion, we covered the whole civil rights thing, uh, we covered the whole Vietnam protest, we covered the whole problems with drugs. Is it too much to ask a policeman to keep his cool when pelleted with bottles, rocks, wastebaskets, and bricks? Let's take a look at some unedited, uncut film. Roberta was principal of a high school. She was a, one of the civil rights leaders. She was incredibly powerful on camera. And the 60s were hugely a defining moment for me because things were happening so fast. The deal is, is we don't mind the blacks coming in the union, but we want them to serve the same amount of apprenticeship we serve. I served five years apprenticeship, they serve five years apprenticeship, not six months and get the same pay I'm getting. Roberta Bird Barr, she knocked a lot of sense into me. I can remember coming back from an interview once and I, I was, kind of teary because they weren't nice to me. It was a bunch of militant blacks and they weren't nice to me. And she kind of looked at me. She said, for heaven's sake, why do you think they'd be nice to you? <laughs> yeah. Wayne Sourbeer was a, a real character. Wayne had been experimenting and doing a lot with nature photography. And we became a team. And when one thinks about, say, the plane we live on, the sort of tidal plane. In those days, I mean, it's hard to believe it, but the media had not really delved into utilizing beautiful backgrounds and beautiful video to be over people when they talk. The great things that the Japanese did in their wonderful screens, particularly where the fogs uh, drifted through. People really didn't realize how appealing it would be to be able to do some beautiful video of particularly our surroundings. Wayne was the photographer for our first documentary that really set us sailing because it was very, very visual. It was Three Artists in the Northwest. 
It was probably the biggest blockbuster I've ever produced. So again, we have this water, which is a, a essential element in our uh, Northwest scene because it's all related to, to our life, our atmosphere, environment, the sky. In those days, women weren't supposed to touch the, the camera or the tape recorder. Wayne insisted that I learn to run the tape recorder and edit it, edit the material. So actually, I came at this business of documentaries uh, by uh, the audio. There's nothing else. There's a law practice you left behind. Family is gone. It's, you're immersed in that world of snow and ice. I don't want to die on a mountain. I think it would be ridiculous to go off and climb a mountain and not come back. I always like to create documentaries with the people themselves offering the narration. My oxygen set is not working. I'm going to try to make it without oxygen. I feel very strongly about that. I think it gives you a, a sense of more immediacy of the people you're featuring. And so I was in the lead and I and Lou right behind me. Trying to hold my hand. <laughs> we walk hand in hand down life's highway. All my shows are based on those marvelous human beings that we find in life. February was identical to the frigid misery of January. At the very start of the last of its four white weeks, there came the day when Rob and I found 15 fresh carcasses of ewes, dead of weakness in the constant cold. Here, here is this Yebu, here is this American, this foreigner, you know, and she's come here and she's picked up our dances and just like that, you know, they're, they're really pleased and surprised. I like people who are trying to make a difference in life or seem to be animatedly living their lives and absorbing things around them that other people can learn from. I'm a teacher at heart. Television, you're inviting somebody into your room. It's different from other experiences. And so there's that one-on-one. -on -one. There started to be drug raids going on in the apartment building, and my kids were seeing this. America, Venya, do my back, or should I be on a Majima, the open, no last year, me, yeah, I've no Jean walking show. Queen Mother. This, is, this has been one of the most special times that we will have as a television crew. When we went to Ghana, I came away so much more enthused and excited about the Peace Corps than I ever was. One of our subjects was a wonderful Afro-American from Harlem. She had joined the Peace Corps. So we were with a black going to her roots. And she got there and she found it so disappointing from the point of view of any real understanding on the part of the Ghanaians of, of slavery. And it was so interesting to realize that these, the people in Ghana had had a totally different experience, life experience. I gained a huge new respect and just an emotional attachment to people living in those conditions. I don't understand it, what it would be like, even having filmed them and talked to them. You can't fathom what it must be like. And yet, they'll give of themselves. They would give us this little amount of food they had. They'd want it. It was embarrassing. <laughs> We're going to have chicken soup and foo -foo. When we went to Ghana, there were just three of us. You're bound to get into bad food. 
on expeditions like that or on shoots like that. And we were in these villages where when you drove into town, you saw rats hanging out over the street for sale. And then you go in and the Paramount chief gives you a big pot that they've prepared for you. And you're supposed to eat out of it. And you think you see some little creatures, <laughs> what you imagine. And both the crew members got sick. And I can remember them sitting under the tree saying, oh, you know, just miserable. We're going to sit down with palm wine today. Then we'll take our kale pectic right away. And I hate to say this because these are very incredible men, but uh, sometimes you do feel that your mothering skills are called upon <laughs> uh, when you're out in the field. When we went to Russia, this was the first American television show that was really shot in Russia. I took two photographers. We took two photographers, plus an audio man. We had to have an interpreter once we got to Russia. We had 27 young storytellers. When you're telling a story, you're really opening yourself up and making yourself vulnerable. But from the first performance, I knew that, the, that it was really going to be a big hit because it was a Russian story in Russian. In those days, we didn't have somebody to keep the budget in the field or to make the hotel reservations or the plane reservations. The producer did that. So not only did you have your crew and your story, but you had all this business stuff to have to tend to. So you have all that on top of this matter of, of directing and keeping your crew going. And I remember in Russia, it was, it was a big, it was really a big, big uh, job for me, taking two photographers, and they're both very macho men. And here I was with these two photographers that I had to let them know what I wanted. And I remember the first, <laughs> the first shoot that we had, the buses were there and the kids were loaded, the Gestala radio was there and, and a lot of, everything was going on. And they went in, they jumped in a taxi to follow the kids in the bus and off went the taxi and I was left at the hotel. <laughs> and I was so mad, I was so mad. I try not to cry in the field, but I really burst into tears. I was under so much pressure. Then I finally caught up with them. And boy, did they ever know who was boss. I mean, you have to, you have to be, you know, I smile and I da 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 da. But boy, you know, if it's my baby, I've got to control it. But that's such a fine line between working with a photographer because you rely on their aesthetic instincts, their capabilities too. Oh, perfect. So you got that. Oh, okay, good. We should. So it's this tender relationship you've got to have with your photographer. You just feel it coming, don't you? You just know that I'm going to go like this. You wouldn't do it. <laughs> I've loved Japan since I went there right after the war to work in Hiroshima. I've done four, four shows in Japan or involving Japan. One of the shows I did was Kataro, who is a new age musician. He was very big in Asia. Very few people in America had ever heard of him. He came and was joined by five hotshot musicians from Los Angeles. Even though they'd told me I could follow him once he got here to America, I found it very difficult. They, they didn't want me to interview Kataro. Uh, they were, didn't help us at all when we first came. So then I started thought, well, darn it all, I'll just do a show about how I couldn't do this show. <laughs> and so I started talking to the musicians, and they were very impatient with Kataro. I've probably rehearsed this music now for 
200 hours, okay? I've been playing the same music over and over for 200 hours, and I finally realized what he's after, simplicity. And the simpler the music is, the more difficult it is to play. By the time they got to the West Coast, guitar started to relax. Our American musicians began to really appreciate guitar. And so I had this wonderful story to tell of cultural understanding that occurred amongst these hotshot musicians and guitar. And it ended up being one of my favorite shows. When you heard the stories of what the people had gone through, it was almost unbearable. I wondered if it may come to the place where the whole world is beyond thinking, beyond deliberating, even beyond negotiating, and come to the place where they only feel the burden of suffering. This sort of thing would bring upon the world if it should ever happen again. Floyd Schmo got this invitation to go back to the peace ceremony in Hiroshima. So I was lucky enough to go back to Japan with him and film him there. He was a, a, a wonderful peace activist, and at that time he was 90. And uh, uh, we call it 90 Years of Tomorrows is the name of the show. The first time I attended the ceremony was four years after the war, when I was still it was still so raw there, and you know, so little had been built up. And that was incredibly emotional when they let those doves fly. I mean, the whole, everybody cried. And when I went back with Floyd, it was equally emotional because since then, I mean, everything's grown back. It's remarkable how they've been able to build that city back again. But they do have an area with the, the, the famous tower, and they have a, a, a bunch of statuary that they have put in around the site of where the bomb fell. And there was one particular one of a mother holding her baby. And every time I look at that, I want to cry now telling about it. Uh, and then when those, they release the doves, the peace doves, and those doves soaring, It's something. It is. Television is a hot medium. It is not a medium for giving detailed information. And I remember Wayne Sauerbeer always saying, we are not here to give a lecture. And so I did move more towards softer pieces, but in a lot of ways, I think they can say more. A man or woman whose mind reigns in the heart when the body seems desperately for connection can only expect more isolation and greater ecological disease. You can get more response if you are somebody who really cares about causes. And I'm, I've got to admit, I'm a cause girl. With the documentaries, my feeling is that for instance with the river and Rainier the Mountain, maybe that's the best kind of ecological story to be able to tell and more people will respond to that than something where you're hitting them over the head with environmental laws. Mountainsides in the springtime and that's where we picked berries and huckleberries and we set up camp and that's where we told our stories and we played our slahel, our stick game. And that's where a lot of our stories come from, the mountain. I found that my place was focusing on and getting the joy out of presenting human beings to other human beings. That what they're seeing is very often the kind of cause you want to have that you feel strongly about. <laughs> Frosty. <laughs>
I'm still shearing my sheep. I mean, those are the things that are just every day to me. All you have to say, you've got to do it, and you'll do it. That's what I did in the chicken house roof. I went up and faced the chicken house roof, but I slipped coming down off it. But I said, well, i got to do it. They've offered me $550,000 for this place. What do I need that much money for? I like it here. I like, I like the view. I just, I just love it. I've always felt if you do it more human and you hit those human universals and you make it beautiful, and there's where it will become compelling. Watch this. Look at that. Whoa. See? And so I thought if I could build kind of a... I'm not sure. You're always scared. Every time I start a documentary, I'm scared. I think, oh my gosh, will this be good? Will people want to watch it? Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And then once I get into it, I get so fascinated by the process and so obsessed by it. I'm sorry to say, but I, I am obsessive. And so then it starts to take its own rhythm and you start to lose your maybe unfounded angst. Something that always makes my heart go faster yeah, when I see it. I hear that. Look at that. Look at I that. Hear that. Look at wow. see. And then you hear the avalanche that falls when they're actually there on the footage. Look at him. You know, I'm not very, I'm not really bright. I'm not really intellectual. When I'm editing, I like to give people a long enough time to get it. It takes a huge amount of discipline and sensitivity to edit slowly and keep people's interest. You've got all this material that you've got available. You've got your audio, you've got your ambience, you've got your pictures, you've got the content, all that you want to get into that half hour. So that it would be wrong to say that, that uh, I don't organize things, and I organize them before I even go out on a shoot. But once I sit down at this table here, something else takes over. I just completely get lost, totally lost. And ideas do come to me as I, as I do that. But more often than not, they come to me at three in the morning when I'm wrestling with something and I haven't made it work. People ask me, what in your life helped you put together documentaries? And I always say, my sewing, because I never would make the pattern quite right, and so it never fit. And so you always had to kind of push this way, this way, and pull that way, this way, and tuck it here. And I find that's the way documentary making is, because you never, you never have all the things you want, nor do things go the way you thought they would when you start the documentary. I think any artist has to have support. And as Guy Anderson once said, it has to be more than your mother. And I am very, very sensitive to any criticism. I've never learned to handle it very well. I remember one very, very important show that all the other reviewers liked, and you know we, we were covered by the Vancouver paper, the Tacoma paper, and so forth. But the Seattle Times did not like it, and I went, I went up, and I remember going up early in the morning to get the paper to see what they'd written, and I nearly fainted. I really did. I nearly fainted because it was such a blow to me. I've never gotten used to criticism. Walt had a client who had some property up on San Juan Island. And the land was extremely cheap. And he asked Walt if he didn't want to go in on the land. So we bought 40 acres as a peninsula. That time it was a big investment for us, but I hate to tell you, 
the little amount we paid for it. Gorgeous location, gorgeous land. But when we bought it, people said, what? What are you doing going way up there? It was just, and we kind of wondered too if it wasn't an awfully long way to go. Well, it's ended up to be this absolutely incredible piece of land for us to have, to have had. I decided I would go up for a month every year and camp and live there and Walt commuted. So I was there with three little kids, two in diapers at one point, living in an Indian teepee, no running water. We would go up there and it meant a lot of reading around the campfire, doing crafts. We made a lot of crafts. I kind of ran a camp for my kids. Having the kids learning to live with nature, we genuinely love and adore this Northwest of ours. Mom, you feeling okay about this? My goodness. <laughs> you can handle this now. Louie, don't do that. Louie, stop it. Are you okay now? Yeah. You gonna make it back? I think I'm all right. Okay. All right, let's go. At first, we didn't even have a teepee up there. Then Walt and I finally introduced, I love to say, introduced the wheel because we had to walk in and we finally built a lovely cabin up there. A little, but it's very little. It's all one room. The kids still camp that way. I want everyone right through your back. Five feet back. Okay, Jean, where are you going to get in? I'm fine. You mean you want me to get in it? Yeah, you're going to get in it next to Walter. <laughs> now, this time I'm taking my five armies. Mm. Now that's really good. <laughs> I mean like strong coffee, apples off the tree that are real sour, <laughs> lemon bars, day old lemon bars from the bakery. <laughs> what more can you add? <laughs> Oh. 
Walt is Mr. Fly Fisherman. And I've done a considerable amount of fishing with him too, but I grew so I didn't like to catch a fish because I never was very adept at taking the hook out of its mouth. Of course, we always release them. But I never was really good. In fact, I'm one of the people who, I don't know many people have this <laughs> To, to brag about, but I, got, I caught a fish on my back cast. <laughs> I was casting back, and, and the fish jumped and caught my fish, and I went clump like this. <laughs> Here was this poor little fish out there in front. <laughs> There is so much that's free that is beautiful here in the Northwest. And that's why I think Walt and I both feel so strongly about preserving the earth and preserving open space and preserving parks. It's just a battle all the time to try to save open space. A friend of mine and I were lucky enough to go up to a, a hunk of property that was high on the island. It's on the shoulder of Mount Dallas, the highest place on San Juan Island. And this shoulder had an incredible view, gorgeous property. People said, what are you doing buying a bunch of rocks up there on that, <laughs> that place up there? Oh, yeah. There's the ledge over there where we used to sleep. We thought of developing it. I went up with a road builder and I walked that property and I thought, my gosh, this is one of the few remaining big hunks that will be untouched up here. How can I, feeling as I do, put a road in here and develop this place? We just had no idea when we first came up here that the land went as far as it did. It's just glorious. I contacted the land bank there on San Juan and asked them if they would be interested in the land. And they indeed were. And we sold it to them at a greatly reduced price of what the land is worth. And we had definite provision in that that this will be public land open for everybody to enjoy and it's now a, a park. I, I'm still at it. <laughs> I won't give up. <laughs> uh, and um, there is a joy to not just producing for yourself. I always kind of con uh, console myself by saying, well, when nobody wants to watch my work anymore, maybe my kids will, and I can do the family bit. And, and, and I am working on that some. I've just loved going out with my little camera and my tripod and just getting nature stuff coming back and putting it together. As so many people have discovered, you can be a one-man band. There's nobody here was about 5.30. 
And my gosh, if a painter didn't walk through my shot, and he was just perfect. And so I went over and videotaped him painting. with your camera and think, oh my goodness, if I get this, well maybe other people can enjoy it too and see it. I think everybody knows what fun it is to take pictures and when you're doing it with the joy of thinking, whoa, this is going to be seen by people other than just me, uh, it's pretty potent stuff. My friend Floyd Schmo, with whom I went to Hiroshima, lived to be 103 years old. <laughs> and I know Floyd always used to say, I always want to have something important to do tomorrow. And we named the documentary that I did on him, 90 Years of Tomorrows. It is so important to keep very, very vitally alive. I come from a heritage of feeling that just because you're 82, you don't have to give up. I think there is so much luck of the draw of how your health is, but I also think that keeping yourself alive and interested and finding something in your life that once, if your job ends, you still have something that's vital to you. I've kept my interests alive and Nothing that I like better than to go up and sit there in front of my three monitors. And I think it's so important that people early on think about those later years. It's just so important you have interesting things that you look forward to, to tomorrow. Funding for Remarkable People, Gene Walkinshaw, is made possible by the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and the Protocol Foundation.